While doing some research and reading some of Hannes Alfvén's papers, I came across a paper that Hannes quoted written by Hekila. Alfvén was particularly disappointed that years after Hekila's paper, nothing had changed and the rather magical idea of frozen in magnetic fields and magnetic reconnection was still being used to explain certain phenomena. In order to understand why this is an issue, I felt it important to cover Hekila's paper, which covers the main problem with magnetohydrodynamics. When we examine plasma in the Earth's atmosphere, the Sun, or in outer space, the current trend in astrophysics is to describe these phenomena in terms of hydromagnetic thermodynamics, or MHD concepts, but this is often to the exclusion of more fundamental kinetic theory. This comes largely because of the success of the fluid theory in describing the shape of the magnetopause and the description of large-scale magnetospheric convection. These successes have blinded many astrophysicists to the limitations of the fluid theory. If we were to define an ultimate description of a gas or a plasma, we would have to include the motions of all the individual particles, the external forces that each particle feels, and then the force that each particle then causes on the particles surrounding them. Realistically, this amount of detail is unattainable. What is useful to consider is a representative particle in the gas, with interactions between particles being represented by average or statistical force fields. It is therefore necessary to consider some kind of averaging over particles in order to get the macroscopic quantities. The most satisfying method makes use of phase space distribution functions, which specify the number of particles with given position and momenta. This statistical kinetic theory generally provides an accurate physical picture when it can be worked out. Unfortunately, the kinetic theory is mathematically very difficult and can only be fully worked out for a few simple and idealized cases. It is therefore necessary to seek a partial answer. One important method is to evaluate the velocity moments of the Boltzmann equation. This moment equation reduces to the so-called hydrodynamic or fluid equations, which can also be derived from the first principles on the basis of fluid concepts. This helps simplify the whole process, but it must still be remembered that the fluid theory is only an approximation to the more complex kinetic theory. The kinetic description is more fundamental and only by means of it can more approximate fluid theory be justified in detail. Approximations have to be made and can be justified in physical theories, but the use of an approximation for one purpose by no means implies that the neglected process in the approximation can be neglected for all purposes. Any approximation must always provide a source of suspicion when the relevant parameters are unknown. Regrettably, the limitations of the fluid theory are too often forgotten. So what are the limitations of fluid theory? There is a fundamental difference between a gas, fluid and a plasma. The properties of an ideal gas are largely determined by close collisions, but those of a plasma results from long-range Coulomb collisions. In a plasma, each particle moves in an average randomly changing field determined by many neighbouring particles. This difference is so important that Styx made the following statement. Perhaps the most remarkable thing about the two-fluid description of a plasma is its validity, for such a description ignores the very nature of a plasma. So why is it then that the fluid theory has been so successful if it seems to ignore the fundamental nature of plasmas? The fluid equations express the conservation of particles, of momentum and of energy, and these conservation relations are of fundamental importance. They are sufficient for many purposes, such as for the specification of the shape of the magnetopores. The first problem that arises is in the choice of the equation of state. Here the difficulty arises from the fact that groups of particles in a plasma do not generally move together, and it is therefore not possible to specify a volume of the plasma that is to be followed in its motion. For the same reason there is a serious difficulty in the choice of a reference frame in which to describe the electrodynamics. Here we need to turn to the frozen field concept.
Here, a magnetic line is identified by the plasma located on it. In such a description, the magnetic field lines are said to convect with the electric drift velocity V, which is equal to E cross B over B squared. This hydrodynamic description is a beautiful example of an approximation that is made for a specific purpose, as was originally pointed out by Parker. In it, Maxwell's and Newton's equations are first examined and all of the non-essential field quantities are removed. Only the field of principal interest, the magnetic field, remains. The dynamics of the geomagnetic field is reduced to a discussion of the balance of forces. Parker's words point directly at the reason why hydromagnetic theory cannot possibly be adequate for the analysis of auroral particle energization. It is not the magnetic field that is the field of principal interest. There is no possibility of particle energization by a static magnetic field, since the Lorentz force on a particle is orthogonal to the velocity vector. On the other hand, a significant induced electric field requires a rather rapid change in the magnetic field. Such a rapid change is observed only during the expansive phase of a substorm. However, there is plenty of evidence for the existence of large-scale magnetospheric electric fields at all times, which can provide the necessary energization. In order to understand the electric field, it is necessary to keep track of the charge separation and electric currents. These quantities are explicitly left out of hydromagnetic formulation. It is therefore very apparent that the auroral particle problem is entirely different in character from the magnetopause problem, and yet people are still hell-bent on using the same theory for both. This has led to a number of common fallacies that are worth discussing. A common factor that comes from the promiscuous application of fluid theory is a mistaken identification of a mathematical sequence of calculations with a causal order of physical phenomena. As an example, let's consider the balance of force between the solar wind and the geomagnetic field. It is possible to describe the magnetopause using magnetohydrodynamics in quantitative terms. These include the magnitude of the discontinuity in the total magnetic field. Having obtained this discontinuity, it is then possible to calculate the strength of the surface current that must flow. It is then stated that the magnetic field causes the current. This is of course the reverse of what happens. For a better understanding of the physics of the magnetopause, it is necessary to turn to a microscopic analysis, based on a consideration of particle trajectories. When this is done, you realize that the surface current is carried by the solar wind particles as they are deflected by the magnetic field in the surface layer. It is the solar wind that drives the current and that this is the direct cause of the discontinuity in the total magnetic field. Its magnitude and location at equilibrium must of course reflect the balance of forces. Using this picture, there is no reason to throw away our previous concepts based on our experience in the laboratory. This way of looking at the problem is also in accord with a mathematical formulation in which a vector field is said to be the result of sources which determine its divergence and curl. Using Dungy's notation, we can now indicate the causal sequence as U, J, and then H, which is the usual relationship and is the reverse of that proposed by Dungy. On this basis of computational experience, Dungy proceeds to reverse causal relationships that have come to be accepted on the basis of considerable experience. On the surface, the various equations, including Maxwell's, would appear to be reversible, but this is a paradox which is true of any microscopic analysis. On a macroscopic scale, relationships are not reversible in general, as can best be understood by entropy considerations, as the problem at hand involves the dissipation of energy, and therefore all doubts as to the causal order can be resolved quite easily. Thus, we can probably agree that the energy flows from the solar wind into the magnetosphere and not vice versa. In particular, the main source of energy is the bulk motion of the solar wind protons. And the ultimate recipient of this energy is the ensemble of particles in the magnetotail. Within the magnetosphere, it must be the electric field that is the principal agent for the transfer of this energy.
as an electrostatic field must in turn arise from the separation of charge as given by Poisson's equations. Undoubtedly, such charge separation in the magnetosphere involves currents. The identification of a magnetic field is somewhat arbitrary as only the magnitude and direction at a point are specified by the fundamental relations. In the frozen field description, the field lines and the plasma are pictured as convecting together, as a fluid with the electric drift velocity. In this drifting frame of reference, there is no electric field. In conformity with the characteristic of a plasma, the electric fields are quickly shielded out by redistribution of charges. This definition is to a large extent satisfactory for a cold plasma with a large external dimension in a smoothly and slowly varying magnetic field. When particles of higher energy or those with smaller external dimensions in a magnetic field with structure are considered, then the MHD model is no longer adequate. In the extreme case, this becomes quite obvious, as it becomes permissible to ignore the electric field entirely, or at least treat it as a minor perturbation when trapped energetic particles in the radiation belt are considered. For such particles in the magnetosphere, with energies exceeding some 100 kilo electron volts, the major cause of drift are the gradient and the curvature of the magnetic field lines. It turns out that for the auroral particles with KEV energies, the electric and magnetic drifts are of comparable importance. These will also depend strongly on the particle energies, the mass, the sign of the charge and the pitch angle. The particles do not travel together, as they are assumed to do in the fluid theory, and it is essential that each particle be followed in its motion separately. Failure to do so dooms any attempt to explain in detail the process of auroral particle energization and precipitation. There is another line of thought which has also taken hold. Let's talk about the ridiculous idea of magnetic reconnection. Here, the magnetic field lines are merged or annihilated during their convection across X-type neutral lines. The magnetic field energy, so annihilated, is thought to be converted to particle kinetic energy. Again, it must be stressed that the only known energization process by means of a magnetic field is through the induced electric field, and this induced electric field is very small. The MHD theory places undue importance on the magnetic field. When we consider the magnetospheric problem in the Earth's frame, it becomes obvious that the magnetic field should be considered as a passive element. The structure of the field is of great importance on the motion of the particles, but there is little or no work done by the magnetic field. The work is done first of all by the flowing solar wind plasma. In its interaction with the magnetosphere, and subsequently by the magnetospheric electric field as the particles cross the equipotential surface. The hydromagnetic approach leads us in a direction that is seemingly difficult to reverse out for many astronomers. The only component of V relevant to their discussion is that of E cross B divided by B squared. In the particle drift approach, this term contributes nothing and the remaining terms alone are thought to be relevant. Any theory in which the basic processes are so distorted must surely be suspect. Many will then come back with statements like this. This does not imply that the microscopic processes are unimportant or uninteresting, but rather that they are secondary. These types of statements are indicative of the reverse logic which is so characteristic of this field. Hekela's paper ends with the following statement. Let us then use the fluid theory whenever we can, but let us not regard it as the fundamental description. Let us be prepared to find that it can be deficient, and so let us use its results with suspicion until they can be substantiated by more basic theory or observation. Above all, when the fluid theory fails, let us neither force it nor castigate it. Let us simply resign ourselves to the use of the more basic and difficult particle drift or kinetic theory. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.